You're listening to The Jay Barker Show on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the show. As just previously mentioned, it's Lars, Matt, Noah is behind the glass. Hope everyone is doing well. Lars was noticing as, as we walked into the studio, we were talking with Christian. Is it the first thing anybody talks about right now? Well, what about that play? Well, what about that play? Should have been this defense. Should have thrown this. Should it? It's in every bit of everyone's conversation. It's not just in the state. It's everywhere across the country. It was, it was a remarkable play. And it just... I'd argue it's the play of the year so far. In all of college football, probably so. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what lays in wait, though, is Georgia. At what time during this week do we start focusing on Georgia? Halfway through Wednesday? We're going to just cut it right in half? You know, it was such a spectacular Iron Bowl. I think it merits uh, another day of exploration and analysis and what the heck happened. Have you thought about it and have a different view than you did yesterday? No, I still am wondering why Auburn essentially just rushed to and had a spy. Uh, why are you using a spy when you're 31 yards out? Um, because uh, essentially you're making it 11 v 10. And, um, and you know, they could have used that extra defender to double bond. And, and also just what, a, what an incredible throw. And Christian and I were just talking about that. And Christian was like... It's NFL. It's, like. It, yes. Yeah. And not only that, it's high-level NFL. Of so course, I mentioned words, Joe, Joe Burrow. Burrow. Mark it four Let's minutes, four into, minutes the show. into the show. Yeah. Joe Burrow will give you till 11 to bring up Nebraska. Okay. Oops, already did. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I don't get tired of looking at it either. Do y'all? No. <laughs> it, it, and the, th the thing is, the throw, and, and you and I were together uh, yesterday afternoon, and they were playing highlights of it. And every time you see it, it's like you see something new and uh, and all the different angles. And, again, that that, that is a throw that uh, and a play that maybe you hit one out of, or sorry, maybe 10 out of 100. So one maybe out of 10. One out of 10. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you hit it that often. Probably even, not. Even at the elite level of the NFL. How, how many times has Brady hit that pass? You know, I, I mentioned this yesterday. I don't remember a signature throw by Tom Brady. That's just because he, what is it, the De phrase death that you, by death a thousand by a thousand cuts, cuts and that's, that's the way Brady picked you apart. Yeah. But I don't, I don't remember one either. And, in fact, do a deep dive here. Do you remember a better throw in the history of football? <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe Burrow had one the other day uh, before he got hurt. What about Tommy Frazier? <laughs> Tommy, Frazier, well, to Tom, get... Tommy Frazier had a run against Florida in the national championship game where he literally broke, I think, eight tackles. You remember that run? Oh, yeah, but he was he he ran a, an option offense. He was yeah. not a passer. Yeah. I was just trying to work the Cornhuskers in for you, Lars. I know. Um, and not even volleyball. Vince Ferragamo, he may have had a good throw for Nebraska back in the mid-'70s. What an interesting character. David Hum, the Hummer. Uh, the, I remember him. Wasn't it Ferragamo that was rumored to have been having uh, some type of a relationship with the owner of the Rams? Yeah, Georgia Frontier. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And he led the Rams to the uh, Super, Super Bowl, Bowl against Pittsburgh. Yep, he did. But I mean, uh, for Alabama, of course, there's second and 26. The stakes were higher, but that's a far easier throw. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I swear, you see Tua make that throw every single week for the Dolphins now. <laughs> Where he just, he looks to the right. And the safeties move over. Then he goes back to his left and just, you know, hits that receiver in stride over and over again. But is that, if you take away second and 26, is that the greatest single throw in Alabama football history? Oh. Did Joe Namath have a signature throw? See, Did Kenny believe Stabler? it or not, I was still relatively young to remember from that time. But on our black and Did white Bryce magnavox. Did Bryce Young have a signature throw? 
Bryce Young well, signature throw was probably against Auburn, right? To, uh, Corey, or to Corey Brooks. Yeah. But that was more catch than it was throw, yeah. wasn't it? That's a good question. By the way, I just thought of one. And I'll, uh, during the next break, I'll try and get a time on it. How long was Milrow in the pocket for that? Oh, uh, I think uh, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi. I'd say five Mississippi. I would say at least five. Yeah. Uh, it was incredible. It's the play, and it is the talk of the town. It's leading up to Georgia, though, Lars. And as we get a little closer to that, I'm hearing, A, McClellan aggravated that foot again, right? And Bowers, I think, is closer to playing than Jace is. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think uh, Bowers maybe could have gone against Georgia Tech, but they wanted to save him. But um, I don't know. I you know I've still been, I've been thinking a lot about can Alabama make it to the playoffs? Um, I think you know if uh, if they beat Georgia, Alabama will. Um, it'd be hard to argue that they're not one of the four best teams in the country. And, um, and, but, you know, people are going to be talking numbers and, um, but just if you are a true college football observer and you pay attention, you watch Alabama play and no, Alabama hasn't been pretty at times, but you know what? They have been really, really good these last few weeks. And uh, the amount of growth you've seen out of this team since their loss to Texas on September 19th has been nothing short of just absolutely extraordinary. And um, and I mean, and also, don't you think like, if if you beat Georgia, who's clearly the number one team in the country, they've clearly been the best team in the country for the last three years. Shouldn't that matter? I mean, shouldn't it matter that Georgia has won 45 of the last 46 and 29, 20, 29 straight in the first team since Yale of 1892 to go 12-0 and in three straight years? Amazing. I mean, what Georgia has done, like, really, like, we, we could devote a whole show, just make it an, an appreciation show for what Kirby Smart and Georgia have done in these last three years. Now, we all forecasted this for this season because the, the schedule was not great. However, you still got to go out there and they're going to get everybody's best shot. And were they really threatened at all this year? I mean, they weren't perfect. They weren't you perfect. Know, but, but were Auburn, they ever... took them, Auburn took them behind the woodshed until that last drive. So you'd say Auburn did the best against them. I, I would have to look at their schedule. But I, I, I but think I think you're you know, right. Georgia Tech was a one score game, wasn't it? And that was just this past weekend. Yeah, but I, I don't I don't think the score was really indicative. I don't, I don't either. But I'm just trying to think of games that were close. But um, Georgia has not been as consistent as they have maybe the last two seasons. Yeah. But guess what? They're twelve and zero. They're number one. I will say well, one thing, though, is their quarterback has never played in a game of this caliber. Neither has Milrow. Well, Milrow has been playing in do-or-die games every single week. But uh, the, the magnitude is still greater than anything he's ever played in. The stakes are so much higher. The Texas game was pretty big. We all Second said we all year. said it was going to be the biggest non-conference game of the Nick Saban era. And it's pretty big, and going on the road and uh, surviving Auburn is, is pretty big. Um, so, yeah, uh, Alabama's going to need some help, I think, uh, to to make it in. But um, look, if, if Florida State loses to Louisville and then Alabama wins, I think it's pretty clear that Alabama will make it in. If Washington loses to Oregon and then Alabama wins again, there could be a debate about whether or not it is a, a one-loss Oregon team that loses by three on the road at Washington. Do they get in over a one-loss Alabama team who lost by 10 at home to Texas? 
I don't know. I mean, there's just there, there's a lot of different ways this could go. Um, but uh, if the favorites win out, and I haven't seen the spread on the Alabama Georgia line yet, so I'm assuming Georgia's favored. The favorites, if the favorites win out, then uh, obviously Alabama not going to make it in. But if Alabama beats Georgia and the favorites win out. I still think it'll be uh, tough. It'll be tough for them to get in. Very. Really, the, I think the key game is Louisville. Man, it would have been nice for Alabama if Florida had taken care of business and beaten Florida State in the swamp on yep. Saturday and night. They, had their they did have their chances, and I, I thought it was going to happen. But it's been that way week in and week out where you think that Alabama is going to catch a break with an, a team in front of them losing, and somehow they have pulled it out. If everything goes their way? Will Alabama still be in? It's a question. We, we'll go over it. Coming up next, we'll talk to Bama 24-7's own Mike Rodak as you listen to Big Noon Sports. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A sunny, cool afternoon, Tuscaloosa side 51. We go below freezing again tonight, clear with a low at 27. Tomorrow's sunny with a high at 56. Thursday, partly sunny during the day. Rain moves in Thursday night, the high at 60. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 53 degrees in Tuscaloosa. From T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. May it may be a tad chilly, but man, it is absolutely spectacular outside. So uh, enjoy the day. Before we go to Mike Rodak, we are going to go to Tina, who's called in with a question about Alabama Auburn. Hi, Tina. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I was just curious, the very last play of the Alabama-Auburn game with the fumble and recovery and um, what seemed to me to be a touchdown, uh, why it was called back. I haven't really heard anyone say. Can you um, fill me in on why the touchdown was called back? You're talking about uh, Terry and Arnold's interception? Oh, are you talking yeah. about, or are you talking yeah, about the a, potential safety? No, yeah. it, it was uh, the interception. Yeah. Um Okay, so that's a good question. He stepped and, out of bounds at the three and a half. Yeah, that's what it looked like. Um, I don't have confirmation of that, though. I, here, the, you want me to send you a because, picture? Which we can do on uh, radio. Right? Yeah, yeah. Can y'all see um, this? No, I, I slowed it down and went frame by frame, and I found the one that gives you absolute evidence that his right foot while trying to tightrope down the sideline into the end zone, hit the line. Okay. And if you'll give yeah. me your phone number, which I guess we've got, I'll send you the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and okay. that, that's what I, it I looked like, too. It, 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 it was so crazy. It, it definitely... Well, the whole officiating yep. was crazy anyway. No so. kidding. <laughs> but, you know... It, All right, guys. We'll... All right. Hey, Tina, great call. Please call again. Yeah, please yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so All much. Right. appreciate it. All right. All right. You Bye -bye. bet. Um, yeah, there's there's pretty clear evidence in the video replay. If you freeze that frame, you'll see that indeed he did step out of bounds. But CBS put the score up. Everybody, I was reading an article yesterday that still said that that touchdown counted. Which I don't but, know. But how you're you do right. That. He clearly stepped out of yeah. bounds, and I and I was surprised that they didn't review that right away. But. It, it just took a little bit of time because they ultimately did review it and they took it away. If they didn't, if they allowed it, would they kick the extra point? No, I don't, I, don't believe, I don't think so. That's a, that's a micro. That's a, above a my pay grade. That's yeah. a Bama 24 seven. Yeah. That's a micro that question. How are you doing, Mike? We're just letting you jump right into the middle of the conversation. How's life in your world? Good, good. I, I will, I'll jump right in because I caught, part of that um i you know to be honest i haven't gone back and looked as deeply as uh you, you apparently have on the Terry and arnold thing to see if he stepped out of bounds or not i think if it was a consequential play to the game that obviously it would have been reviewed um in this particular case it didn't really mean anything one way or the other um as far as the result of the game so that's why i don't think there was really a second look at it 
Um, and there was confusion. I, mean, I think even on the scoreboard in Jordan Hay, I remember looking up and seeing um, 33-24, you know, them giving them the touchdown, and then it changed, and I saw the stats, you know, on my computer change too. So, you know, they took it off. And maybe there was an announcement, I forget, by the ref, but... Yeah, I mean, um, and they had it up there on CBS, too, yeah. for uh-huh. quite a while. Maybe even an after, I don't know if they they had ended the broadcast. But, you know, the fact that Auburn was a 12-and-a-half point underdog, uh, it didn't change the outcome for Vegas. Right, right? exactly. <laughs> so if, if it if, was if, consequential if, to that, yes. they would have looked so at it. So it would have been a replay, yeah. and then they would have kicked the extra but no, point. That, but this is the, the other question. Would Alabama be compelled to kick the extra point, even though all the the game is is for all intents and purposes over? Would they have to line up, or either you know just take a knee, or do they have to kick it in that situation? Uh, I was listening to that as well. I was trying to remember because I get mixed up sometimes between the NFL and the NCAA rule, which I believe are different for that. And I I would have to double check myself. I believe college you don't kick the extra point. I think in the NFL you do because I think back to there was a Patriots-Bills game in 1998 that was very famous because the Bills were protesting a uh, pass interference call on a touchdown with no time left. And so they actually weren't, they, they left the field in protest uh, for the extra point because it didn't matter to the final score and, and the Patriots just lined up with their field goal unit and walked into the end. Oh, that's right. I remember They should have gone for two then. They did. Yeah, yeah. That, that they did. Yeah, the kicker just walked right in. Um, <laughs> So I, I believe that rule is still exists at the NFL level, that you still have to line up and take the extra point. Um, and I believe it doesn't exist in college football, but that's something that obviously doesn't come up too often, and I just I just forget exactly where things stand on those two rules right now. It could also be up to the, dis- the discretion of the referee. Like, you know, if you got got 20,000 fans on the field <laughs> and, and you don't need to necessarily kick it, Whatever they do, it should be a hard and fast rule. Yeah, it should not be at anybody's because option. Of, because not of the Vegas. referee, yeah. not the no, home team. I, I agree. It's I agree. like I think in the NFL, you have to. Isn't that what you just said, Mike? Yeah, I'm fairly certain that's still the rule. Um, again, I get mixed up sometimes. I haven't covered the NFL and now I haven't covered college. Some of the rule differences I are kind of lost in my brain somewhere, but uh, I believe that's the case. So before fourth and thirty one, did you have your lead written for Auburn upsetting Alabama? Oh, I had all of it written. I mean, it was uh, <laughs> if, if that play was anything short of a touchdown, then Auburn gets the ball and they take a knee, and that game's over. You know, within a a minute in in real time of of that play. So uh, I had everything ready. I had everything for it, basically ready to publish headline, photo, all of it, and. Uh, <laughs> It was honestly like I, I've been asked, like, is it shocking? Like, it was surprising. I don't know if I'd call it shocking. Like, this team has converted some pretty tough third downs, and this was obviously a fourth down, but they've they've made some plays in, in kind of tight situations like that already this year. Um, and once you're kind of watching Jalen just kind of sit in the pocket and he has all this time and they're not rushing him, and you figure, all right, like Alabama has some pretty good wide receivers and they're probably better than what Auburn has. And DJ James is not a bad player by any means, but um, no, no, you just figured that Alabama had a chance to make a play there, and and they did. I mean, it was statistically highly improbable, but for some reason in my mind, I'm like, all right, like there's still there's still a chance here. Uh, but with all that said, in, in my job, you still have to be ready to have the losing story ready, and I certainly did. Give us your uh, breakdown slash analysis of the fourth and thirty one play, both from Alabama's perspective, the what they ran, and also Auburn's perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you're Alabama, you, you have to run what you ran. Um, how exactly some of those routes unfolded in the end zone? It's, it's hard to you know to see on the the TV copy um, to see exactly what sort of combination they were and why Isaiah Bond was able to get open in the corner. Um, you know, from Auburn's perspective, I know there's a lot of debate or discussion about, um, you know, why only rush two and kind of j- give Jalen all that time. And, you know, I think it makes sense, I think, to get as many guys back into the end zone as you can uh, for that sort of play. Um, you know, I think in the NFL, you see a lot of times teams will put 
like a tight end, you know, a six six, six seven guy out there, you can bat down a pass. Um, I don't think Auburn did that. I, I would have to go back and look. In, even if they did, that guy's probably in the middle of the field, and I don't think he's getting over to the corner uh, with you know the velocity of that Jalen Miller throw. He wasn't just lofting it up there. I mean, it was it was being pushed into the corner there, and really accurately so, um, and underratedly so. I, I think Isaiah Bond gets a lot of credit, and he should, but it was also a great throw by Jalen Milrow. But to me, you know, I think it's okay that Auburn only rushed two. Um, the confusing part to me was they had a spy. You know, there's that third guy who was right over the middle of the line. He wasn't rushing, but he was just kind of hanging back, which is what a spy does. But, I mean, there was a 0% chance that Jalen Milrow was taking off and running with that <laughs> yeah. football in that situation because there's just no way you can get 31 yards in the touchdown. That's what Matt and I have been running. saying is essentially 11 v. 10 because that spy right. is just a, a wasted player. It was a wasted player. Taking yourself out of the play. Yeah, that that's the part that didn't make sense to me. But, um, you know, if I, I think if it was fourth and – 40 fourth and 45 i think maybe you send three or four rushers and try to put some pressure on them um and, and try to force a quicker throw before those routes can develop downfield but in this case like it's i find it hard to fault the overall you know philosophy from auburn there i just don't understand how bond was matched up one-on-one with a with a well, corner, the, the, the corners I mean, the, had the corners of the yeah. end zone, and then they doubled the, the, up the three and, inside. And, and the safety, for whatever reason, on that side bit and went uh, in the other direction, leaving that corner. Uh, you know, with his back to the quarterback, one on one, and uh, and again, uh, Mike, I mentioned, you know, Jalen just had the perfect aiming point, and that's the the pylon. And I bet if you uh, if you stretch that pylon up ten yards straight up, he would have hit that thing. I mean, it was just an perfect. absolute perfect throw. Yeah, and that's that's you talk about like his progression and, and development. I mean, that's that's where it is because you know his first couple of years and even earlier this year, like there's throws where he had time and everything was perfect and just. I mean, misfired. There's a lot of go back to man. I think it was like the Arkansas game. I remember throw five yards over the middle, and you know, you one hop it, and it's just like it's, it's infuriating. I'm sure as fans because it's it's an easy throw, and and it's um, you know you're not being pressured, and, and the receiver's open. In this case, it's like you had the, the receiver open, you made the throw, you had all the time, and, and you made it work. So that was uh, certainly a sign of a lot of progress on his end. I want to ask you another rules question that something came up in this game that I went, wow, is that true? Also, I want to know your personal reaction. What did you physically do? Mike Rodak is our guest on Big Noon Sports. Down to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. And our guest from Bama 24-7 is Mike Rodak. Mike, tell everybody before I fire a couple of questions at you, how folks can read and keep up with you. Yeah, uh, Bama247.com and on Twitter, uh, at Mike Rodak. Cool. All right, what did you physically do? I've asked all our guests this week, when you observed that play did you did you throw your hands up did you yell did you scream or did you just start changing your lead <laughs> it started working um and you know the press box typically clears out um you know by the end of a game so there wasn't a ton of people there but uh obviously cheering is, is not allowed in the press box and uh, any sort of uh really any sort of noise that's disruptive to anyone isn't allowed either so uh, really, everyone's just busy. Uh, it, it just goes from everybody's busy trying to get ready their stories for, you know, Auburn winning, Alabama losing, to then having to change everything and uh, frantically change headlines and photos and tweak scores and stats and all that. And um, so it's really just focusing on on that, to be honest. And people just kind of looked at each other like, "Whoa, uh, what just happened there?" But um, you know, it's it's a working environment so nobody's really 
um, reacting. Um, but I'll say this, as far as what we talked about the last segment, I did look it up during the break. And, um, yeah, college, you don't have to kick the uh, the extra point if it doesn't affect the outcome at the end of the game. NFL, you used to, but it actually got changed a couple years ago after that Minneapolis miracle play, uh, the Stephon Diggs catch against the Saints in the playoffs. And the Saints left the field in protest and – uh, the Vikings had to kick the extra point, but you don't have to do that anymore in the NFL. Ah, interesting. Um, wait, wait a minute. So they leave it up to who? Can they kick it if they want to? Can you kick it if you want to? I would have to check that. Okay. Uh, I think it allows you the option of not kicking it. But you're right. I mean, there's certain reasons, like Will Reichard, for instance. Imagine if this was his last game and he's tied for the NCAA uh, record for points and um, you know, he needs one more point to break the record, and that's the extra point at the end. Like, that would have been a big deal for him. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's uh, just I, – I don't think it's ever really happened where people have opted to do it, but I guess maybe there is a, an exception in the rules for it. Looking ahead to the SEC championship game on Saturday against Georgia – what does Alabama need to do to pull off the upset? And I must confess, I haven't seen the line yet. Four and a half. Four and a half, Georgia. All right. I think it's split up to five even after okay. the uh, the Iron Bowl I've seen. Uh, as high as five, which it's still – it ended at six two years ago, um, the 2021 game, which is the biggest um, underdog that Alabama's been since, since 2010 or since 2009 even. Um, and there's only been four games in which Alabama has been an underdog in the last 13 years and all four of coming in Georgia, <laughs> this is the fourth one. Um, so you can make an argument that if they win this game, it's the biggest upset, the most consequential upset of Nick Saban's of the Nick Saban year, I'd say post, you know, 2009 after the first championship. I think that's fair to say. Um, and I think it would be a bigger upset than two years ago. Um, because I think two years ago was all about can Alabama's offense move the ball against, Georgia's defense, which was completely lights out that year. And the answer was yes. Um, obviously, they had Bryce Young. They had John Mechie before he got hurt. They had Jamison Williams. And they were able to do that. I think this year, it's shifted more to me towards can Alabama's defense stop Georgia's offense? Because Georgia's offense, under the radar, is one of the top five in the country. Um, and it's right up there with LSU, which gave this defense problems. And uh, we all saw this defense struggle against Iran, against Auburn. How much that carries over to this game, I don't know. But, I mean, this is a top eight passing offense for Georgia as well uh, with Brock Bowers, who gave them issues two years ago. And, uh, you know, Carson Beck's had a really good year. And uh, Lad McConkey, like, this is a really good offense. Um, and the defense has slipped a little bit for Georgia. So maybe it's a question of how much Alabama can do against their defense. But I still think the bigger question to me is what can Georgia's offense do against Alabama? And, um, you know, it's if they play the way they did against Auburn this defense, I think they're going to be in some deep trouble. I think Nick Saban has kind of already said that and warned against that. So um, they need to get a whole lot better, but that uh, that can't happen. You know, I think it's possible. I just, again, I think it would be the biggest upset of, of the post-2009 Saban era. I just looked it up, and this is the ESPN scoreboard website, and they now have Georgia as a six-point favorite. It's a pretty, yeah. That's yeah, a pretty depends. big jump. Depends on the book, um, but I think as dramatic and thrilling as the Iron Bowl finish was, I think everybody also saw the way Alabama played for the first 59 minutes of that game. And, you know, that cuts into some of the momentum that they had um, with the LSU really ever since the second half of the Tennessee game. I think second half of the Tennessee game, they outscore them big. LSU game, you know, they win a big game. Kentucky, they blow them out. Chattanooga, they blow them out. And then they sort of lost that a little bit against Auburn. And that's something that Saban's talked about. Is you don't want to lose momentum. Sometimes it's hard to get it back. But I think it, it cuts into the idea that this is a completely transformed team because they were doing some of the same things that they were doing wrong earlier in the year. Touchdowns, call back by penalties, bad snaps, kind of weird boneheaded mistakes on Jalen Milrow's part, you know, throwing the ball ahead of the, the line of scrimmage twice. Um, and those things kind of came back. So are they completely – New? No. I mean, it was a tough environment. A rivalry game? Yes. But was it an Auburn team that just lost to New Mexico State? Yes. So I think people on the outside kind of look at that and, and lean a little bit more towards Georgia than they probably would have 
granted, Georgia didn't play lights out against Georgia Tech by any means either. Um, but I think overall, um, people are kind of looking for evidence that Alabama can play with the number one team in the country, and that, to the slightest extent, took a hit on Saturday. How do you think Kevin Steele plays this on Saturday uh, with the Alabama defense? Do you, do you play him straight up? Do you do something special for Bowers, who I think we all expect is going to play and be very healthy? Um, or do you do something exotic? Or is it by this point in the season, you kind of you are who you are? Yeah, I mean, they've, they've shifted some things around in the secondary in particular. Um, you know, with Caleb Downs playing star this past game, against Auburn, whereas that was Malachi Moore's job, but then there was also, for a while, Terry and Arnold's job when um, uh, Moore was hurt, uh, or Jalen Key was hurt, too, at safety. So, you know, they've had some different combinations of guys. You know, I think the biggest question for me is whether Moore plays star and Downs is deep, or whether Downs plays star and Moore is deep. Um, you know, sometimes it's a question of, do you go with your three defensive lineman package with, you know, three linebackers and keep either Braswell or Turner off the field or, you know, rotate them. Or do you play both of those guys and go a little bit lighter and play two defensive linemen? I think against this Georgia team, against this offensive line, against this running game, you probably want to go a little bit heavier, but that might take Braswell or Turner off the field. And I mean, Carson Beck has barely been touched all year. I forget where exactly he's at in terms of the number of times he's been sacked, but like it's a small fraction of what Jalen Murrow has been sacked. Um, two different quarterbacks, but I mean, this Georgia offensive line is good. They're a very efficient offense. It's a very clean operation. So you want to disrupt that somehow, uh, whether it's more blitzing or whatever it might be, we'll have to see. Um, but again, I think for me, it starts in the secondary and how exactly they pair some of those guys up. Alabama traditionally has just loved man to man. And I know that there's been zone mixed in there, but if they do play man defense, uh, who do you think is going to get the majority of the snaps going against Brock Bowers? It's, it's either going to be Downs or um, Malachi Moore in my mind. Again, which I think plays into which one plays star. Um, but you also could have one of those, you could have your dime defense on the field and have, you know, money, have the guy who plays money play that spot and um, have your star do something else. I mean, there's, there's different ways to do it. I think Brian Branch two years ago got most of those snaps. Um, against Bowers and, you know, really good player for it just because he's physical and, and can tackle well. But even, you know, he had some trouble uh, against Bowers' ability to kind of run around and get loose. So, um, I, I, personally, I would lean towards a more experienced guy in Malachi Moore than, yeah. than putting a freshman on him. Yep. Um, but I, I also think Caleb Downs is, you know, pretty athletic player, instinctive player who tackles really well. So that, you know, could indicate that he's a good player to put on Bowers too. All right, our rules question for the entire table here. <laughs> In the game, Milrow rolled out. He was getting significant pressure, and he just kind of pitched like a two-hand chest pass, the ball out of bounds, okay? Auburn guy catches it. It was There was some question of whether or not the ball was going to cross a line of scrimmage or to be, you know, be intentional grounding. But the Auburn player caught it, and it was, believe it or not, it was Gary Danielson that explained it. That line of scrimmage on a play like that extends past oh, out of bounds. Did you know that? No. Yeah. So okay, I go ahead. Mike. Watching, yeah. Sorry, watching live, um, it did come up in the press box. We we're all kind of thinking, like, are they going to throw the flag there because the ball didn't get back to the line of scrimmage and we couldn't really see a guy catch it. I mean, we're up in the corner and can't really see where the ball lands on the sideline amongst all the bodies. So our first reaction was, you know, that probably should be grounding. We thought Alabama, you know, got away with one. And um, that was after they got away with the face mask penalty at the very beginning of the game and kind of say, man, like they're getting some calls today. Yeah. Um, and I think I even mentioned that, you know, on our, our message board and everybody, you know, kind of snapped back and said, Oh no, like the Auburn player caught it. And you sound like Gary Danielson and, um, I, I would assume, and I think it, it kind of goes along with like a batted pass. Um, you know, if a quarterback is outside the pocket and his pass gets batted down, does not get back to the line of scrimmage because of that, you can't fault him for that. And I think the same logic would apply. Yes, you do extend the line of scrimmage all the way outside the out-of-bounds line, but if the ball is impeded by 
a player from the other team, then it, it doesn't really apply because you can't assume where it would have went. So that's what I think saved him in that situation. But um, it was close to being another, again, kind of boneheaded penalty on his end where he's just kind of not making the right decision. And even, um, you know, the last, you know, the third down, the third and 26 before the fourth and 31, where he got called for being downfield, um, he should have ran the ball. And that's something Nick Saban said too on his, his TV show after the game was like, if he had just tucked and, and run the ball and he had plenty of time, he probably could have got down to the five yard line. Uh, but for whatever reason, he decided he wanted to keep throwing the ball there. And that's when he was across the line and, and got himself in trouble. All right, Mike, uh, final question for you. Let's uh, assume Alabama upsets Georgia. What is the most likely uh, way for Alabama to make it into the college football playoffs? Either a loss by Texas or Florida State. Um, I think those are the two safest options, if you will, uh, for Alabama. Um because if it's just Alabama beating Georgia and if Texas wins, if Florida State wins, if either Oregon or Washington wins and if Michigan wins, then you're really in a hard spot because then you're trying to say to the committee that we deserve to be in over Florida, which is undefeated. And Florida at that point would have proven to some extent that they can play without Jordan Travis, um, even though they, they won't have him for the playoff. And Oregon – even if they win as a one-loss conference champion, it's already ranked higher than you. They would, would have just picked up a top three or four win against Washington. Like, I, I wouldn't count on that winning in Alabama's favor in terms of being you know, the last playoff spot. So I think the safest route is Texas loses the Big 12 to Oklahoma State. Alabama would be in, in my mind. Or if Florida State loses the ACC to Louisville, Alabama would be in, in my mind. Um, but if neither of those happens, then again, I think you're you're really hoping for something else. And at this point, I just I really don't see it. To be honest, I think Alabama is playing in the in the Fiesta Bowl if that happens. Does Georgia have any shot to make it in? Do you think if they lose? I do. I, I think if if Alabama, the um, same same logic would apply. If if Texas and Florida State both lose, then I think Alabama and Georgia would both be in. Uh, I think Texas and Florida State would both be out with a loss, obviously. And then it would be Alabama, Georgia, Michigan, and the Pac-12 winner. Yeah, so many games that matter this yeah. weekend. <laughs> um, it, it's it's, it's kind of hard to focus. It's kind of hard to figure out, bouncing around in your rain. Well, if, if this win yeah. went how? And it just keeps going around. Well, around, around. the good part of it is that it's kind of spread out. So the Pac-12 game is Friday night. And then during day Saturday is the Big 12 game. And so at that point, you already know about Texas and the Oregon-Washington result. And then Alabama plays, it might be at the same time as the ACC game, and then um, or maybe at that, that's at night. Then the Big 12 game's at night, which doesn't really matter for Alabama unless Michigan somehow loses, but that would be you know pretty shocking. So at least it's spread out. All right, Mike, appreciate your time, and we'll be following you on Bama 24-7, and uh, let's see what happens this Saturday. It's going to be crazy. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Mike Rodag from Bama 24-7 on Big Noon Sports. Let's take a few phone calls, shall we? We shall. 205-342-9904. Give us a shout. Lord, I'm- Laura Lee Thompson is known as the Bama Broker. She's a Tuscaloosa native, an Alabama graduate, and the only realtor in town with Wall Street experience. A skilled negotiator, Laura Lee knows how to buy low and sell high. And the Bama Broker isn't just going to show you houses. No, Laura Lee is going to educate you on the market, guide you to homes that fit your budget, and teach you how to sell your home for its maximum profit. Throughout the entire process, the Bama Broker will equip you with the tools you need to both buy a home and build financial wealth through home ownership. Trust me, the Bama broker, who's as roll-tied as houndstooth, will get you across the goal line. That's Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama broker with Advantage Realty Group. You can reach her at 205-790-7229. Again, that's 205-790-7229. And you can also email her at Laura Lee at thebamabroker.com. That's Laura Lee at thebamabroker.com. 
Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A sunny, cool afternoon, Tuscaloosa side 51. We go below freezing again tonight, clear with a low at 27. Tomorrow's sunny with a high at 56. Thursday, partly sunny during the day. Rain moves in Thursday night, the high at 60. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 53 degrees in Tuscaloosa. More Big Noon Sports coming up. If you'd like to join the show, just hit the digits, 205-342-9904. Quickly, hands on buzzers. Who's the number nine team in the nation? Nebraska. It's Missouri. Oh, yeah. Hey, they just don't <laughs> – they just seem to be an afterthought. They're 10 and 2. They're running back – who was a co-SEC uh, Offensive Player of the Week, and his name escapes me right now. That kid is good. He's brutal. I mean, he will. He just soon run over you. And um, I think he ended up leading the nation. I'm going to look that up. But first, another you day. Have, yeah, yeah. You another, got another Colorado update. Another day, another player leading Colorado's recruiting class. And so yesterday, kind of speculated. Hey, did Deion Sanders? Uh, Issues with geography and not not knowing where Mount Rushmore was uh, caused some players and their parents to be like, hey, do we really want to play for this dude? And I, I think, you know, in, in looking at it a little bit deeper, last week after Winston Watkins Jr., who had committed to Colorado, he reopened his commitment, he reopened his recruitment Deion Sanders went on a bit of a rant and he proposed that the NCA modify its recruiting policy to prevent players who have already committed to a program from keeping their options open. And this is what he said. He said, a kid ain't even faithful to his girlfriend. You think he's going to be faithful to a school? Come on, man. That's an emotional thing. What I wish is that the NCA would do if you're committed somewhere, you can't go on any other visits. If you're committed, that means you're committed. You can't go on no other visits. Why wouldn't you be committed, but you're still letting kids go on visits? That means you're just playing. Well, apparently that did not sit well with uh, several of the recruits who had committed to Colorado because since those remarks were uttered, uh, he lost a four-star quarterback from the 2025 cycle, uh, Antoine Hill Jr. Uh, that was on Sunday. And then Monday, he lost another quarterback, uh, Danny O'Neill, uh, in the 2025 cycle. And then uh, late last night, he lost a running back, uh, Jamaris Walker, who decided he needed to uh, reopen his commitment. So, um, you know, Deion Sanders... Maybe not making all the right moves. Colorado finished uh, the season four and eight overall after starting three and zero. Oh. Deion Sanders was the talk of the country. Tim Brando came on this show week after week saying the biggest story in college football is Deion Sanders. Well, I'll tell you what, Deion Sanders is no longer the biggest story well, in college football. No, he is because of his he's failing. <laughs> you know, early in the year it was all oh, hail Deion. I mean, you they, know what? I lost, wonder if Dion stops recruiting when another player commits to say UCLA. According to his rules, that's the way it should be, right? He doesn't want to work. You know, I just ever since I don't he blame. Hey, up, by the way, I don't blame him. Like if I if I was a coach, that would just drive me insane. But, doesn't he need but, to but just the thing be is, it's quiet. never been that way. That's why there's a difference between a verbal commitment yeah. and a signed right. commitment. It has been that way since you and I have been covering college football. Maybe they should just be able to sign any time. I don't know. Uh, I That's more- not a bad idea. Yeah. Then you are committed. We got to go. Cody Schrader is the running back. Philip M. 
Securing the best mortgage possible requires a lender who has knowledge, is trustworthy, and treats customers like family. And no one is better at all of this than the mortgage miracle worker, Haley Sansing. Based right here in Tuscaloosa, Haley Sansing has spent decades working in the mortgage industry. With Haley, it's personal, holding your hand from contract to close. With Haley, it's about one thing, you. Call Haley on her cell, yes, her cell, 205-792-1813. That's 205-792-1813. Let Haley help you. NLMS number 230376. WTBC Tuscaloosa and W265CG Tuscaloosa, a town square media station. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. From the Fox Sports Studios in Los Angeles. Here's Monsi Bolaños. One day after firing first-year coach Frank Wright, Carolina Panthers owner David Tepper addressed the media, and this is what he had to say about his rookie quarterback. As far as Bryce Young is concerned, and I think everybody in this building would share this sentiment, we are totally confident in that pick. Okay, I think the people that made that pick first, you know, would be totally confident in that. And for me... I'm totally confident in agreeing with that pick. In other NFL news, Colts running back Jonathan Taylor suffered a thumb injury against the Bucks that is requiring further evaluation and puts his status in doubt going forward. This is according to the NFL Network. The Colts face the Titans in Week 13. And in the NBA, Pelicans guard CJ McCollum plans to take part in shoe round Wednesday and could return to action as early as that night against the visiting Sixers if all goes well. McCollum last played on November 4th when he suffered a right collapse Long. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. We are back on Big Noon Sports. It's Matt, Lars, Noah, the gang is all here. Uh, coming up in just a few minutes, uh, congratulations to Jacksonville State because they're going bowling, and I think that's cool. And one of their longtime assistants and a longtime football coach for like 50 years, Tuffy Crow, is going to join us in just a few minutes. I mentioned Eli Drinkwitz and, and Missouri. And here, how about a, a quick dive into Eli? First of all, you would think that Eli would be short for? Elijah. It's Elijah. I didn't know that. Did you, it's not like you're going to get that in Trivial Pursuit at Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, but I can't, apparently... Which I this, dominate. This bio, that's because I wasn't active. Um, yeah, why are you sitting on the sidelines, man? Well, I didn't know how long it was going to last, and you know, oh, I was going right, to go meet guys, my son. You guys needed and, to leave. And we needed yeah. to leave, and, and I didn't record, want to yeah, jump in to, there and dominate for Just to be clear, a uh, uh, Matt and Karen came to my house for uh, Thanksgiving. We had a great time, and and uh, you know, like after after the food has been served and dishes done, like let's get out to board games. And yep. I have old school Trivial Pursuit, the original Trivial the Pursuit, the original card, the original box, everything. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was ready to get it on, but Matt had to leave. Uh, well, you were doing quite well, I guess, quite well, as opposed to the others. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. search, 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 anyway. Search. anyway. Um, it says here, or it doesn't say, he ever played college football. How many coaches do you know other than Jack Crow uh, who did never play the game? Or maybe played in high school but not in college. Very few. Mm, McDaniel, at, uh, is that his name? The head coach of the Dolphins? I keep wanting to say... Is it Josh? Jim? No. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think anyway, there, there are some NFL coaches that haven't played. And it's, I've probably already given you too much information on Eli Drinkwitz. Although, I like him. I, I, I think he... Uh, I like he has him, a really, too. He, he gets it, I think. Yep. But I just wonder, why is his name not mentioned for some of these hot jobs? Well, I think it's because you have to look at what he was doing at Missouri the last three years. Yeah, before his he, ten and two. he almost got canned. Yeah, he was I, 500 for three years. Yeah. Um, but before that, he was App State. He was 12 and one. So, I mean, he has, I, I would think, a, a record that would deserve some consideration, but you never hear it. Of course, it could be, ha- be handled behind the scenes, and that's the reason that we don't hear it. Well, but one more, and I'll go on. Yep. Do you know who he was at Auburn? Did not. 
He was at Auburn with Malzahn uh, in 2004. And then, uh, then he went back. Now, he was at Springdale High School in Arkansas. He was with Malzahn then. Yep. And then he went to Auburn as the quality control coach and was on the staff 2010s when Auburn won so it all. So Gus kind of took care of yeah, him. Yeah, he did. But uh, by the way, could you please define quality control coach? You make sure that the control is quality. <laughs> all right. I know you have another subject. But, uh, I brought it up for one. We both like the guy. Uh, he's ranked ninth in the country right now. And because he's outside of the eight, you know, he's not getting a whole lot of attention, nor is Missouri. But you mentioned their running back, Cody Schrader. Yeah. If wherever he, they go bowling, watch him. He's he, a brutal guy. I'm, I'm trying to think of somebody that. Do you think he'll get a Heisman invite? Uh, Probably. I not. hope so. Yep. Yeah. I hope he does, too. I mean, he's he's an incredible runner. He has just enough speed to turn the corner. Yeah. But if you want to talk about a guy that runs behind his pads, between the tackles, just watch him. He's going to be a good NFL player, I think. Um, so this comes from our buddy Pat Forty. And uh, I really like and respect Pat. I have uh, traveled literally all over the world with him. And um, I know some people in the in this state aren't huge Pat Forty fans, but uh, I think he does a great job. And uh, he is very much plugged in. And uh, he has reported that for much of the day on Saturday, it appeared that Texas A&M was about to hire Mark Stoops. Uh -huh. And um, and uh, it like it seemed like it was almost a done deal and things were f so far down the road that sources told uh, Sports Illustrated, um, and uh, presumably that's uh, that's Pat, that Stoops was telling some staff members, friends, and boosters Saturday night that he was leaving for College Station. But then something happened. Now, what actually was it? Um, the word coming out of Aggieland was that the offer was rescinded. And then uh, at 1.02 a.m. Eastern Time, Stoops put out a tweet that said, in part, I knew in my heart I couldn't leave the University of Kentucky right now. <laughs> so when you put out a tweet like that at 1.02 a.m., that means like you were probably had you had one foot out the door and you're doing a little CYA uh, to make sure that uh, you'll be welcomed back. But, um, you know, since Stoops was telling people just hours earlier that he basically was gone, it certainly appears that Texas A&M was the the one that, that pulled the plug on the deal. That certainly seems to be the more believable scenario. So why would Texas A&M do this? Money. And I believe, and, and so uh, do sources uh, who told uh, Pat this, that uh, regents or, you know, uh, big dollar boosters told Ross Bjork that they would not support the hiring of Stoops. And here's the deal. As a, as a general rule, don't let off-campus people decide who your coach is going to be. That is a really bad strategy. ADs are paid a hell of a lot of money to make these decisions. And, uh, you know, if they're not good decisions, you know what you do? Fire the AD. Fire the AD and get a new AD. But... Um, you know, this isn't a first in college football where boosters jump in and and uh, and and disrupt things. Well, now, the most would, obvious would, across Stoops, the state? would Stoops have been a bad hire for an a for A and M? Um, you know, he has done a great job in making Kentucky co competitive, which is no small task. He's won ten games twice. In 2018 and 2021, he's beat Florida three years in a row. He's beat Louisville five years in a row. He's the winningest coach in Kentucky history. 
and he's really popular among the fans. But so why wouldn't A&M want him? Well, past two seasons, he's just gone 14 and 11 overall, 6 and 10 in the SEC. Um, you can, if you really dig deep into his record, it's been padded by playing three cupcake non-conference opponents every year. Uh, th- almost 40% of his career wins are against low level FBS or FCS opponents. Um, he's been paid a lot of money and he's never won an F- uh, SEC East title. Uh, and just two winning seasons, SEC records, excuse me, just two winning SEC records in 11 seasons. He also, he got in a public feud with John Calipari. So there's, there's just a lot of, a lot of stuff, right? With, with Stoops. And I think, uh, that, that A&M boosters, they just said, Hey, Ross, we're not going to stand for this. And I think Ross caved. I'm surprised. I'm surprised, but I, I trust, I really trust Pat's reporting here. And uh, so A&M quickly moved on to Elko. If you're one of those big time boosters and you've just stroked a check for $25 million because you wanted Jimbo out, do you not deserve a vote on who's coming in? Fair question. I would say no. Do you, if what you do you want, think? If you want to, I don't know. It, you know, it's... It, it, let football people make the football decisions, right? Yeah, but if you're going to let him make the decision, let him make the decision. Don't call him up at 1 o'clock in the morning and say, I don't like this guy. Or should have should he have gone to them first? Because obviously he didn't. But if you're not going to go to them, why are you going to let him influence so, the decision? And, and Elko almost didn't come. Uh, sources tell 40 that Elko... He left A&M's private jet waiting on the tarmac for about 90 minutes late Sunday night before committing to take the job and getting on the plane. So, you know, he's talking to his wife. He's talking to his agent. He's talking to by probably himself, the, the AD. Uh, you, know, you know what that tells me? I would never want to coach you, Texas <laughs> All right. Uh, when we come back, Tuffy Crow, the one and only, will be with, with us on That's big. It's always Next like sport. this at A&M. Did you hear what I said about uh, another school that tends to let their boosters run thing? Auburn? Auburn, yeah. They've been doing that for quite a while. All right. And you know what? They usually cave, too. All right. We'll be back in a minute. <laughs> It's back. Laura Lee Thompson is known as the Bama Broker. She's a Tuscaloosa native, an Alabama graduate, and the only realtor in town with Wall Street experience. A skilled negotiator, Laura Lee knows how to buy low and sell high. And the Bama Broker isn't just going to show you houses. No, Laura Lee is going to educate you on the market, guide you to homes that fit your budget, and teach you how to sell your home for its maximum profit. Throughout the entire process, the Bama Broker will equip you with the tools you need to both buy a home and build financial wealth through home ownership. Trust me, the Bama broker who's as roll tied as houndstooth will get you across the goal line. That's Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama broker with Advantage Realty Group. You can reach her at 205-790-7229. Again, that's 205-790-7229. And you can also email her at Laura Lee at the Bama broker.com. That's Laura Lee at the Bama broker.com. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A sunny, cool afternoon, Tuscaloosa side 51. We go below freezing again tonight, clear with a low at 27. Tomorrow's sunny with a high at 56. Thursday, partly sunny during the day. Rain moves in Thursday night, the high at 60. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 53 degrees in Tuscaloosa. Covering SEC sports like Kudzu on the roadside. This is Big Noon Sports. It's Matt, Lars, Noah, and my main man, Larry Tuffy Crow from Hueytown, Alabama. He's a golden gopher, ladies and gentlemen. How you doing, Tuffy? Oh, the golden gopher. Yes, going? sir. Hey, we were just talking going on the break about Eli Drinkwich. Um, I was looking at his bio. And apparently he never played college football. That's kind of rare. Jack Crow is another one. Yeah. 
but those are the only two that come to mind immediately. I did not know that. I, that's an, that's, uh, yeah, usually it's tough. Now, I tell you, more people are going in starting in student assistance now in a program then a GA when they graduate, and then they'll get on to full-time, and then they just keep bumping up. I, I do see more of it now than you used to, but not much. Coach, um, I'm just really interested in your career. You have been at so many different stops. What has it been like for you just on a personal level I always uh, am very intrigued with uh, how it impacts family and just even the 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 person when you are hopscotching around the, the in your case mostly the South, but uh, just really all around the country for other coaches who choose to go into this profession. What what are some of the pitfalls of that? A lot of it's. A lot of that is your family, the ki- your kids. Really, they're moving sc- school systems. You, they get started in a system, go a few years, and then you make a move, and they have to uproot. And that's probably why both of y'all know. That's probably why so many coaches, coaching staff, families are so close. So a new staff comes together, however many of them now, and. uh so they're all in a new spot. The families seem to gravitate because the wives and the kids and all are are strange to an environment, and they seem to be able to. You've got a little family within uh, within a family, I guess. And it, that's probably the hardest part is, is your kids. And, you know, but, I, uh, yeah. I wrote a book with Bruce Arians, and, uh, yeah. and, and B.A. told me the absolute low point of his career when it was when he got fired as offensive coordinator at Alabama, and that wasn't the low point. The low point was having to go into his daughter's room and tell her that they're going to move again, and she just absolutely started crying because, you know, uh, they just had – she had just uh, – I think was in the middle of her freshman year of high school. Did you ever have a moment like that with uh, with uh, your daughter or your son? I did. I luckily I did not. Thank goodness. But uh, I know Bruce. Uh, Bruce did. Hey, that that firing turned out pretty good though, didn't it? <laughs> he went to coaching. Went yeah, he did. He year. went. Yeah, he went. Uh, he got hired by the Colts, and uh, they kind of put him in charge. Do we take Ryan Leaf or do we take Peyton Manning? And uh, I think Bruce, uh, he made the right <laughs> made pick a good there. Call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Matt. Matt, no, Rick Christopher, one of our best friends, oh, yeah. was with us at UAB. Came from Mississippi State. Was on Jackie Sherrill's staff there when Watson came in 1995 to UAB. Rick's oldest daughter was going into, was halfway through her junior year in high school. Moved her from Starkville High to Vestavia. And she did great, but Rick later on said, you know, if I'd have had to do it over again, I'd have probably left Connie and the girls over there and let them, let at least the oldest one, Chrissy, finish at Starkville where all her friends were. But, yeah, that's one of the pitfalls. I know Bruce has said a lot about missing Jake being able to watch Jake, his son, who played for us at UAB. Um, during Man, that he had a leg. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He, he kicked that field goal his last play of his college career, kicked that field goal at Tulane at Superdome and won it. And, so, and, and it's pretty, and it's pretty cool too that he uh, he made it to the NFL. Yeah, yeah, he played for the Bills. He sure did. I think now, yeah. he, now he like sells jewelry to the stars or something, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. He does a lot of stuff, yeah. yeah he's, he's got a lot of irons in the fire. Uh, and you yeah. know when he kicked that field goal at the Superdome, there were seven people there to watch. There were seven. Do you remember how empty it was when we played down there? It was just – what is it? Somebody said – Gary Sanders may have said you could uh, you could practice archery in the stands. <laughs> what a great line. Hey, Dan, but you remember y'all, y'all both been there. You know, the seats are different shades. They're different colors or different shades around the Superdome. 
I, somebody said they did that, make it look like more people were in there. That's exactly <laughs> why was, they did it. It was bad now. <laughs> Um, <laughs> always had a good time in New Orleans, though, didn't we? Next oh, subject. Oh, it was a great time in New Orleans. <laughs> hey, Tuffy, uh, you were, I guess you may have spent most of your career at Jack State. I don't know if it's tied with UAB or not, but that's not my point, really. How cool is it to see the Gamecocks go bowling? How about the Gamecocks, huh? I tell you what, on uh, your first year in Division I, or F C uh, FBS, I guess it's called now, to go, be able to go to a bowl game and have eight wins. I tell you guys, man, I, we've talked about this before. Rich Rodriguez and this bunch up here can coach now. They have done an unbelievable job. And uh, just to be able for these seniors to experience the bowl. Seniors have experienced when we were in the playoffs here before, but that's a different animal. You're going on a real, real business trip when you're when you're going somewhere in the playoffs. But I don't know how you can you you're entertained and you have a good time at a bowl game. So I hope they get somewhere where they can enjoy themselves. They are they deserve it. I think this this illustrates right here uh, how small the coaching world is. That Rich Rod used to live right across the lake from. Bruce Arians and Christopher up in Reynolds he Plantation, sure Georgia. He sure uh, yeah, so. when, he first, he said, he, when he first got up here, he told me, he said, Oh, I wish I'd have never sold that lake place. Yeah, I didn't realize he did. We had him on uh, like two, two weeks, weeks ago. Um, but just it, it, talk about the job that he has done. I mean, because you, you know uh, the the. The, the difficulties, the inherent challenges in that position, and just uh, what what do you think? Just uh, again about about uh, Coach Rodriguez. I think him starting with him and then going all the way through the assistants um, who he brought most of them, a lot of them with him from Louisiana Monroe, where he had been with Terry Bowden, and then his biggest hire. He told me the first day is here. He said. I'm hiring the best offensive line coach in football, Rick Trickett. And uh, great story. Rick was driving. Trickett was driving from West Virginia to Monroe, Louisiana, to take the offensive line coaching job with Terry Bowden. Rich calls him. He stops by here to take the job. <laughs> Turned around, went to Virginia, West Virginia, got some clothes, and came back. So, But I tell you, the guy, Rich, he's probably told y'all, too, he, he got a great little line he said hey they need to put a statue of me in uh tuscaloosa if it wasn't for rich it wouldn't have nick down there <laughs> that's right <laughs> he's, he's very but self-deprecating he, and honest about that too uh um, yeah it's uh it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's it's a really funny thing but uh yeah no i i, I think he's done a a phenomenal job um just shifting gears a little bit you obviously pay attention to what Alabama is doing. Your thoughts on the Iron Bowl? Wow, <laughs> I'm I'm watching it on TV, and I told Matt Jane had gone downstairs; she couldn't even watch it anymore. And I'm watching it. I got nervous. I got on the treadmill walking. The last minute or so, I'm like, "Oh, it's what fourth and thirty-one or whatever it was." It was fourth and goal from the 31. I'm like, uh, this, this thing going to be Alabama's favor. And then goodness gracious, what a play <laughs> uh, on both sides. Of, the pass was incredible. And then the catch and him be able to get his foot down. But I tell you, that's got to be as good. The Alabama Auburn games <laughs> have through all the years, you know, the fix it, go all the way back to, uh, the two block punts Auburn did at Legion Field. It seems like it's every year. I I was on the sideline with my son at that time it was probably ten. Matt, when we were with the Birmingham Stallions, and Coach Fuller, Jimmy Fuller, who I'd worked for up here, was coaching at Alabama. And I got to see two years in a row from the sideline, one to the Van Tiffin kick and one bow over the top. So wow. those games have been just amazing. <laughs> Through as long as I can remember, and I'm old, I can remember a little way back. Uh, there, that one the other day may take the cake, though. That 
I don't know how they did it, but they did it. Yeah. Um, the only one is just far as sheer down the wire excitement. I think that could compare is uh, eighty five with Tiffin's kick. Yeah, that one. Uh, and we were standing. Jason, my son, and I were standing on the sideline. Man, Laura, is this Joe Namath, Leroy Jordan, Bill Battle are standing by us? Just happened to be, and Namath is just dogging the Auburn players. I'm thinking, you know what? What a great rivalry. This guy hadn't played here in how many years, and he, they're still on him. And he's from Pennsylvania. <laughs> and he's from Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Duffy, can you hang on? Can you hang on through a break? I can. I'll get you off the treadmill. All right. Oh, Duffy right. Crow, longtime college football coach and pro with the Stallions. Boy, those are some good times. We won't go into that, but we will come back on Big Men Sports. Alabama, Georgia. 10, 5, touchdown, Alabama. It's the SEC Championship live from Atlanta, Georgia. Let's get out of here again. Alabama wins it. Cheer on the Tide this Saturday as the Crimson Tide look to get revenge on the Bulldogs. Our coverage starts at noon from Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia. On your home for Alabama football. Brought to you by Birmingham Racecourse. BirminghamRacecourse.com. You can be a winner, too. The best sports talk in Alabama. This is Big Noon Sports. It is Big Noon Sports. Wow, what a sunny, brilliant day. A little chilly, but I'm loving it. And on oh. uh, on the show here today is Tuffy Crow, and uh, we continue to chat with him. I looked up real quick. You know, these people try and predict who's going to play in what bowl game. It amazes me how accurate they are at times. But, Tuffy, I think the first one I saw Jack State might be going to was the Camellia Bowl, which is in Montgomery. But now I'm seeing the Cure Bowl. Raise your hands if you know that where that's played. Cure? Cure Bowl? I, I can't. Where is that one? That's a new one. That's in Orlando. Not oh, a bad okay. trip. Well, that's, that's a good trip. But, I would personally, me being an old Jack State guy back in the day when the Jack State Troy – Rivalry was so great. I'd love to go to the Camellia Bowl and play Troy or New Orleans Bowl. I think Troy plays for the conference championship this this weekend. If they win, I think, from what I understand, they go to New Orleans. But any of them be great for these players. I think they've got uh, South Alabama playing in Montgomery. But, they? Uh, I mean, how many? Let's South count. Alabama? How many are going bowling? Alabama, Auburn, Troy. South Alabama, Jacksonville State. Am I leaving anybody out? That's all from a state of about 4 million people. Pretty yeah. Good. Coach, I was, Pretty good. I, I'd love to get your analysis of these uh, championship games this weekend. And uh, we don't have to dig too deep, but just uh, sort of your gut reaction of what you think is going to happen. And I'll just go in order in which they are played. Uh, the 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 big one on Friday night, uh, seven o'clock central, in Las Vegas is Oregon at Washington for the Pac-12 championship. I think if you're an Alabama fan, you obviously want Oregon to uh, win this game, and uh, and then you know worst case scenario for Alabama if they end up winning becomes a debate of whether or not Oregon, a one-loss Oregon, gets in over a one-loss Alabama. Uh, your your thoughts on Oregon-Washington, and, and does Bo Nix have the Heisman Trophy wrapped up? I don't know. I wish he would. I, love, I'm, I think, personally, that Oregon may be playing the best football of anybody in the country right now. Um, and being state of Alabama guy, I'd love to see him beat Washington and help Alabama out. And i tell you what, I'd hate to be on that committee, though. Wouldn't you? Would, what yeah. if, what, like you said, Alabama wins. What if Oregon wins? Good. Nice. Who are you going to put in? And then uh, Big 12 championship on uh, Saturday at 11 o'clock Central Time in Arlington, Texas. You got 
Oklahoma State playing Texas. Boy, Alabama fans, they got to be rooting hard for Oklahoma State. They're Cowboy fans this weekend, aren't they? Um, <laughs> I don't think Oklahoma State can can beat Texas. I, I've known Mike Gundy for years. Matt, you know, Kale, his brother, worked with us oh, at yeah. UAB. And and Bill Clay that was with us at UAB he had just retired at 80 years old this past season. That was at Oklahoma State. And, but I, I can't. Texas is playing well right now. Goodness. Boy, they made a mess of Texas Tech. Yeah. They oh, did. just. Oh. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. again, I'm just going in order these that these games are played. Then you have uh, uh, it, the SEC championship game, 3 o'clock Central in Atlanta, Georgia against Bama. Do you give Alabama? And, and Georgia's now favored. It just keeps going up. I, last I saw, it was six. Yeah. Um, I think it started about four. But uh, what is Alabama? What is the path to victory for Alabama in this game? I think that it it's all going to depend quarterback play. I mean, the Milrose is playing fights out. Even, um, you know, Auburn trying to keep a spy on him on defense the other day, but I, I, I think I've learned a long time ago, if I bet, I wouldn't bet against Nick Saban. <laughs> they, but Georgia, good. What is it, 29 in a row, y'all? They've won yep. now? Yeah. When And you, you guys know how it is. When you're winning and you get in that mindset, it's just it's different. For some reason, you don't think you can get me. Um, I'd like to see Alabama win it. I'm just not sure they can with with all the talent and then, Georgia has. And then, uh, well, let's say for the sake of argument that uh, Alabama upsets Georgia, we won't even deal with the Big Ten championship because uh, I think Michigan is absolutely going to throttle Iowa. Michigan right now is a 23-point favorite. That's at Saturday, 7 o'clock in Indy. But the game that absolutely could decide whether or not Alabama makes it in or not is going to be Saturday, 7 o'clock Eastern, Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte, North Carolina. Number 10, Louisville, playing Florida State. Florida State, obviously, without their stud quarterback. They're playing with a backup now. And uh, Louisville coming off a loss to Kentucky. Can Louisville pull off the upset? I think they can. They, um, it's hard to play with. You lose that trigger guy. They're, they're talented all around. And the backup quarterback seems to be doing a good job, but he's He's not going to win a game for you. If Louisville can put some pressure on him on defense and try to make him make a mistake, get uneasy, not let him get set his feet in the pocket, I think Louisville's got a chance. Um, I, and and I, it's crazy to think that, again, if Alabama beats Georgia, it's very possible that their playoff hopes will come down to Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's something. Hey, we were talking earlier about Rich Rod and them doing a great job up here. I tell you what, Nick Saban and those guys have done a tremendous job. From that first game against Texas and then South Florida up until now, the offensive line to me had, had gotten 100% better from early on. Just through the year, through this year, they've just gotten better and better. So, from a, I'll tell you where I'll, I'll be watching that one. I find that very interesting you say that about the offensive line because Matt and I have been kind of obsessed with the offensive line this year at Alabama. From a coaching perspective, what do you have to do to get them to, you know, start playing as a cohesive unit is, uh, you know, in in the cliche everyone uses is, you know, five fingers uh, on the hand. Yeah, that's probably the hard, that is to me the hardest position to get everybody playing the same uh, because if you if all five if, if one has a mistake then the play is going to blow up but 
I think they've just kept kept going in practice and working on fundamentals and technique and ton of film work that they've gotten a lot better to me. The left tackle, there's a fresh. I started to say a rookie is a freshman, didn't he? And, yeah, true. Uh, you know, he played like a freshman early, but uh, now he's he's gotten better. The entire group now, if they could just not snap the ball, just <laughs> <laughs> you know, make sure they snap it on the snap count. <laughs> oh, I, I I'm going to be. I'm going to say that's going to be a toss up now. Georgia, Alabama is going to be a toss up. Um, you hear, I always hear about the team that like makes the fewest mistakes. And, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Alabama didn't come out and run the football and try to run it and run it and throw a little play action deep. You know, Mill Rose loves to throw the ball deep, run it, get them safeties coming up and try to throw it over the top. Oh, going to be a fun weekend. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> say hello to Miss Jane, and uh, you and I will talk again real soon. I know that. I saw y'all were going, said y'all were going to, what, the Ennis Free Irish Pub Friday afternoon? I believe that's the plan. Oh, yeah. You that should, sound like a fun one. You should come over and have some shepherd's pie with me. I might, well, we <laughs> might have to. The, the, the uh, Irish Pub reminded me of the great one on Green Springs back in the day. Oh, gee, what was it? I can remember Hale. the guy that owned it, but I can't remember. Hale. Hale. Yeah. Uh, right there by the softball field, wasn't it? Man? Yeah, on the other side of Norms. <laughs> We're not going down that road. All <laughs> right, Tuffy, uh, thank you. Hey, great to talk to you guys. Thanks, Tuffy. We'll see you soon. See ya. All right. <laughs> Boy, if we had another couple hours, we could tell some stories. Hey, we'll be back in just a minute on Big Noon Sports. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A sunny, cool afternoon, Tuscaloosa side 51. We go below freezing again tonight, clear with a low at 27. Tomorrow's sunny with a high at 56. Thursday, partly sunny during the day. Rain moves in Thursday night, the high at 60. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 54 degrees in Tuscaloosa. From T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. So the power playoff rankings will come out tonight. Now the other polls, the coaches and the AP poll, both dropped Ohio State following their loss at Michigan to six. Both those polls did. What's going to happen to them tonight? in uh, rankings that really count. Okay, so before we get into the rankings themselves, I think it's important to have a little refresher here of some of the key points that the committee members are going to consider when deciding a team's ranking beyond their on-the-field record. Strength of schedule, conference championships once they're decided, Uh, head-to-head competition, not good for Alabama. Results versus uh, common opponents and results versus ranked opponents. So um, I think right now uh, that, that uh, clearly Georgia is going to be number one. And uh, in, look, the, the Bulldogs, they struggled against Georgia Tech, but they also were missing three of their top five wide receivers, including Brock Bowers. And so um, I think uh, all three of those guys are going to be playing against Alabama. I could be wrong on that, but I think it's accurate. I'm, I'm nearly positive that Bowers is going to play. And number two, you, you obviously, it, it's got to be Michigan. Um, you know, uh, knocking off Ohio State uh, for the third straight year. Um, heck, who knows? Maybe they don't need Jim Harbaugh on the sideline. <laughs> um, and so, look, and they're playing Iowa, which is just, they're a horrible team. No, yeah, no, they, they beat no, Nebraska. They're a horrible offensive team. Yeah, they got a great punter and a great defense, but uh, Michigan's going to throttle them. And I think three, you'll have Washington, as you should. uh, And four, you're going to have Florida State. I mean, so 
right now, you know, if those four teams win on Saturday, that is going to be uh, the playoff field. And that also will be, uh, in, in my estimation, that will be the seeding. Uh, one Georgia, two Michigan, three Washington, four Florida State. And I think the committee, yeah, they might have Ohio State at five, you know, but and I know Alabama fans could be up in arms about that. Uh, but don't worry because Alabama will leapfrog Ohio State if Alabama beats Georgia uh, again because what is really important to remember is that conference championships mean a lot. And uh, and so if Alabama is the SEC champ, they're definitely going to leapfrog Ohio State. Uh, I think Oregon will probably be six. Texas will be seven. I think Alabama is still at eight. I do too. I mean, I just uh, it, it's pretty seems pretty cut and dry how it's going to go. Oregon maybe will be above Ohio State, although I think Ohio State's loss to Michigan is a better loss than Oregon's loss to uh, Washington earlier in the season. But again, all this will get resolved. And and um, interestingly, you know, the the, t- the highest ranked team with no shot at the college football playoffs is going to be a team that we've been talking about a lot today about their coach Missouri. and their running back. Missouri is right. at number nine. Yep. Missouri's going to be at number nine. Um, and then I think you'll have, you know, not that it really matters, uh, but Penn State will be in there, Ole Miss, Oklahoma, LSU, Louisville, probably around 13 or 14. Uh, that is intriguing because, again, it very well could come down to Saturday night. Can Louisville beat Florida State in Charlotte for the ACC championship? If that happens, then I think Alabama's got a great shot to make it in if Alabama beats. I don't know. Are we spending too much time on 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 this on the possibilities rather than actually focusing on the game well i think it's fun to talk about and maybe we should be more focused on alabama georgia which as the week gets older i'm starting to uh, have my concerns and and uh, the largest concern is that uh, even in winning games this year alabama's still mistake prone and i know georgia's made their fair share too but in the balance of mistake football who wins that who, who's made more mistakes this year, Alabama or Georgia? Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they made a bunch Saturday. But, um, Who would you take right now as your starting quarterback? Milrow? Or Beck? Or Beck. Uh, I, sh- I shouldn't answer that on this radio station. I'm, uh, no, I'd I'm probably ta- take... And you know because me, he can I'm run, I would, I would take Milrow. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, Every day. But, Oh, Twice on Sunday. Why, what, I don't even know the... What is the origin of that phrase? Every day and twice on Sunday. Well, I need to look it up. It, or did it, I butcher the phrase? I don't know. Could it have something to do? No, I think that's it. How often do you take a shower? How often do you take a shower? And twice on Sunday? Yeah, I use one. <laughs> you take two showers on Sunday? Yeah. Is, is it not? because is it, is well, maybe that's reason? the phrase right there for Noah yeah, every day I, of the I, week? I, <laughs> no, we need you to chime in more, man. That's good stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, I uh, pretty much going into the show today wanted to find out how many times Noah Haynes showers on <laughs> Sunday. I mean, that's top shelf stuff. That's above the fold. It is. It's how many times do you shower on Sunday? Shower. One time is not a hair shower. Oh. So it's like a bath and then a shower? No, just one time I wash my hair and one time I don't. Oh. Because you can't wash your hair too much or else it will be bad for you. Uh, as Winston Churchill once said, why stand when you can sit? It's the beauty yeah. of a bath. But you're also sitting in what you just washed off. <laughs> sitting in your own there's, stank. There's the big, there's the big <laughs> deal. Of course, stank, you know, if, but if you're using Lumi, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Ryan Fowler in the house.